Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Joelle Neff. Unfortunately, you don't get to see the wonderful face of Mike Whirling this morning, who is our um, normal MC, but he is um, out in the field doing another project today. So you're stuck with me, um, but I hope that's okay. Um, we're so excited to have you here this morning um, for coffee and pest management. Um, we are recording this, um, so it will be available for um, viewing after today, um, and that will be sent to everybody who has registered. So you guys will get a recording of this, and it will be on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, or if there is a pause in speaking or Laura's finished, please feel free to unmute yourself at that point um, and then be able to ask your questions. Um, but until then, please keep yourself muted while Laura is speaking. Um, I want to introduce our speaker this morning for coffee and pest management. Um, Laura Ingwell is our speaker and she is an extension specialist um, for fruit and vegetable IPM at Purdue University. Um, and we had her last year during a, a integrated pest management um, talk and she did an amazing job. She's full of knowledge. Um, and I know you guys are going to learn a lot from her today. Um, so without further ado, ado, Laura, go right ahead. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much. Um, if you do have questions or want to um, interrupt during my presentation, please feel free to do so. Um, I would rather be interacting with you than just talking at you. But um, I do have a presentation to share, and um, what we're going to do today is actually talk a little bit about integrated pest management once again, um, but I'm going to focus on three insects that um, were suggested to me as um, something that you all may be interested in learning a little bit more about. But first, a background on me in case um, you weren't at the last talk I gave. Um, I am a extension specialist in the Department of Entomology with a, the broad title of horticultural crop or specialty crop IPM, so working on fruits and vegetables. Um, my particular area of interest and expertise comes around controlled environment productions, so ways in which we can protect our crops from abiotic um, extremes um, to help grow them more effectively and efficiently. And so one of those structures is called a high tunnel, which you can see here. Um, it's a metal structure that has plastic stretched over the top of it. And I have spent quite a few years understanding how insect pressures may differ in these structures and the best ways that we can manage them. And so that has given me a lot of experience with crops like tomatoes, cucumbers, and specialty melons. Um, I've worked with pests, including cucumber beetles and the bacterial wilt that they transmit, which we will be talking more about today. A variety of different mite species, which you can see um, in the middle here, two-spotted spider mite or russet mites. Aphids, which we're also going to talk about today, but then also a lot of beneficial insects. So I've done some work looking at commercial bumblebees as a supplemental pollinator that we can put into an ecosystem for pollination services in our crops. And so we can integrate them into controlled environment growing. Um, and I've also worked with a whole slew of natural enemies that we can use to manage these pests. And so we're going to talk a lot more about these today as we go through some of the IPM strategies for our three key pests. And so really our objectives for today is to review or um, introduce you to the application of IPM in particular to manage three groups of pests. First, we have caterpillars on coal crops. So this is what we call the crucifer caterpillar complex. Then we'll be discussing aphids and lastly, the notorious cucumber beetles. Um, so just to review, for those of you that may not be familiar with or haven't heard this term in a while, IPM is called integrated pest management. And so the pest here really can be any pest. Today we're talking about insect pests, but you can use this framework to manage weeds, 
and diseases, any sort of pest. Um, this is even applied to say cockroaches in your home. It's really a strategy. And, and what I really love about it is it's a sustainable strategy. It has a long-term goal in the way that you're managing these. And so the best definition um, that I like to use is the, an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of techniques. And so the two key things here is that we're talking about long-term prevention. So it may not be here and now a problem that I'm encountering at this moment, but thinking about how did that problem happen and what can we do in the future, next year or next cropping cycle to help mitigate that problem. And the second part of this is using a combination of tech techniques, which really gets into the sustainability of using IPM as pest management. You're not relying on just one tool, um, but you're thinking about all of this different set of tools that we can use together to help with better suppression. And these include things like variety or cultivar selection, the timing at which we're planting, the location, things we can do in the habitat to help manipulate either the presence of beneficial insects or deter the presence of pest insects, um, incorporating biological control and always as a last resort, pesticides. And so a good way to sort of lump all of these different strategies or tools together is in four different um, sort of broader control mechanisms, which I refer to as our toolbox of IPM. And so we have these four main mechanisms that we can use in insect pest management. And that includes cultural controls, mechanical controls, biological, and chemical. So as we walk through these three main pests that you may be all too familiar with today, I am going to comment on um, control methods or management techniques within the context of these four broad categories. So we are going to start with delicious cruciferous vegetables. Okay, this is a very diverse and broad group with really sort of a small genetic background, um, but we have bred them to create something tasty and delicious such as broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale. Um, these are all very closely related and they are all munched on by a suite of caterpillars, which we refer to just to make things simple as the crucifer caterpillar complex. So you may experience one or two of these, or if you're lucky, you may find all four of them in your garden. And so we kind of lump them all together because the management strategies that we use are most often effective against all of them and because you'll see them co-occurring in your crop. So the actual identity of the organism in this case may not be necessary, but I do want to tell you a little bit about some of the differences in case you're just curious and you want to know who these caterpillars are that you may find on your crop. So the first one we have up here on the left is the imported cabbage worm um, or the pierid butterfly as people may refer to the adult. So in all of these situations, the caterpillar is the pest, but you may see the caterpillar um, feeding or you may see the adult flying around the crop. And so this one is like the most sluggish, thickest green caterpillar that you'll find. The next one that I think is a little more rare is the cabbage looper. You can distinguish this one from the others because it's much more slender and it has this behavior in which it moves along the plant where it creates these loops. It kind of inches its back up to the front legs and then crawls the front legs forward and then inches back up and crawls forward. So we often call loopers inchworms as well. The third species, which is out right now and very, um, very abundant is the cross striped cabbage worm. This is the only one among the four that lay their eggs in clusters on the plant. And so oftentimes you will encounter an aggregation of multiple caterpillars. 
all of these other species will lay one egg here and move over on the leaf or the next leaf and lay another egg, but these are all laid in one big patch and so you'll see them clustered on the plant. And the last one that we have is the diamondback moth. It's a very, very small slender moth here. The caterpillar is also very, very small and it's very aggressive in trying to ward off predators. So if you bump or disturb this caterpillar on the plant, it immediately will start wriggling violently and try to get away from you. And so that's a really good way to distinguish that caterpillar from the rest. Um, they are also very small and they will create this cocoon right on the leaf. So you'll see this little silk sort of nest lingering after they leave. Diamondback are usually present very early in the cropping system and then tend to go away. Imported cabbage worm are pretty consistent throughout the entire growing season from spring till frost and cross striped cabbage worm come in a little bit later. So around late June, mid July, you'll start to see this one in, in the crop. And so when we think about managing this pest, we have to make sure we understand its life cycle and be able to target the most susceptible stages of the life cycle and those that are also the most damaging on the crop. So as a brief review of a uh, caterpillar, moth, or butterfly life cycle, um, you have four distinct stages that all look different in appearance. So this insect goes through what we call complete metamorphosis. The larvae look nothing like the adult. And so what you will find first on the plant is an egg or a cluster of eggs often laid directly on the plant tissue. Those eggs hatch into caterpillars, which is the larval stage. This is the stage that causes damage. They start out very small when they hatch from the egg and they eat a little bit of the plant. But as they molt and grow into larger and larger larvae, as they get close to maturation, they consume more. So the bigger they get, the more of the plant they're eating. So oftentimes they're easier to see when they're larger. Then the caterpillar, once it's done feeding and ready to turn into adult, it will um, it may leave the plant and drop to the soil, or it may just move to a sheltered place on the plant. And it will go through um, a pupal phase, which we call a cocoon or a chrysalis. And this is sort of the resting stage. No eating is happening here, but they're transforming into the adult. And then the adult will emerge out of this. Adults may contribute to pollination. They fly around and maybe drinking nectar from flowers, but really they're just mating and laying eggs. Um, to have more offspring and more damage. So the damaging stage is the larvae. For management, you really can target any stage. The best thing to do is prevention, which is interrupting the ability of this adult to oviposit eggs on the plant in the first place. The next best thing, if you can't um, interfere with that stage, is to then um, get those larvae when they're smaller and they don't consume as much plant material. Because we have four different species, there's near constant pressure from at least one of these on the crop at all time. And so what that means, when we turn to our toolbox and we think about these four different groups of control measures, in terms of cultural control, we have a little bit here with crop and variety selection, where we can choose crops that are less preferred by this um, suite of caterpillars to help lessen the damage. Then we get on to mechanical controls. This is interrupting that ability for them to lay eggs. So we're going to talk a little bit about exclusion, then biological controls, and lastly, chemical. And so cultural controls, here is where I wanted to talk a little bit about crop selection. Um, we know that insects have certain ways in which they locate their host plant and some just taste better to them compared to others. That can have something to do with the physical appearance of the crop or it can have to do with the secondary chemistry. So chemicals within that crop that can either be attractive to them because they protect them or deterrent to them because they don't taste good and may have some um, insecticidal properties. And so if you look at just a small subset of the crucifer crops that are available, 
Um, this year we're doing some work at the Purdue Student Farm. So we're looking at a mixed, what they call their spring planting of cruciferous uh, vegetables, which contains cabbage, which is um, a few different varieties, but here's one in particular um, that I think is quite common where you get the, the tight head of cabbage, collards, kale, and kohlrabi. So all of these are suitable hosts for this caterpillar complex. But what I'm showing you here is that host plant preference among these caterpillars. And so we go out every week and we count the number of caterpillars and the number of eggs on each of these plants. And the only thing I want you to take away from this graph is that there are differences. Some of these crops have more eggs and caterpillars on them compared to others. And so if you have a little bit of uh, variety in terms of what type of crucifer you want to grow, we can tell you that collards are probably going to get attacked the hardest. Kale is one that we don't see a lot of damage on. Cabbage is variable depending on the type of cabbage and kohlrabi. Um, but this is where you can just take notes in your garden and see which ones are getting chewed on most and maybe plant a different variety the following year to help manage that pest. The next control is exclusion. And we'll talk about this one twice today, but here we're looking at a leafy green crop, not a flowering crop. So there is no pollination needed to grow this crop to maturity, which means that you can keep it covered up all year long and not interfere with um, the maturation and production of the crop. And so what we've been doing a lot of research on and a lot of small farmers use are these low tunnels or protective cloth that you just install over the crop for the whole season. And what you're doing there is creating a physical barrier where that moth or butterfly cannot make contact with the crop and lay its eggs. And so these, you just stretch a piece of um, wire metal from one end of the ground to the other, and then you pull this fabric over the top and sort of tuck it in the soil. And it can be a really great way to grow some of these crucifer crops without having to intervene with any type of pesticide. The next thing is looking at natural enemies. So who do we have present in the landscape that can help with this pest suppression? There are two naturally occurring parasites or groups of parasites that attack this um, suite of caterpillars. The first are tachinid flies. So this is um, a parasitic fly which will attach its egg to the exterior of the caterpillar. So you can see the white egg here on the front of this caterpillar. And out of that egg, a fly larvae or maggot will hatch and crawl into and kill that caterpillar. And so this one is an ectoparasite. It's laying its egg on the outside of that caterpillar. The next um, one we have are some parasitic wasps. So this one in particular is a cotija wasp. What happens here is the wasp actually stings the caterpillar and lays its eggs inside of the caterpillar body. The eggs hatch, the larvae feed on the inside, and then when they are ready to pupate and turn into adults, they emerge from the outside and they spin a little cocoon. So each one of these little silky, like hairy covered globs on here is a new adult. And so this is something you can look for in your garden. And if you're encountering these caterpillars, but you see the, this part's hard to see, right? Because the eggs are very small. But if you see caterpillars that are covered in this, what you want to do is leave those cocoons there so that you can maintain and help enhance that natural enemy population. Another enemy, uh, natural enemy that is quite effective against feeding on these caterpillars is one of the predatory stink bugs. And so here's just a moment to talk a little bit about how identification matters. We have two different stink bugs here in this picture. One of them is a beneficial stink bug, which means that it uses that piercing sucking mouth part to pierce into other insects and consume them. While the other is a pest and actually an invasive stink bug, which actually uses that piercing mouth part to feed on fruits and vegetables. Um, so the brown marmorated stink bug is on the left, which is a pest and you don't want present in your crop. But the spined soldier bug is a beneficial predatory 
insect that you do want in your crop. So learning to recognize some of these common beneficials and distinguish them from pests can help you um, keep them around in your garden um, and leave them be when you encounter them. So the two main differences here, it's hard to tell in the photos, but brown marmorated is a bit larger. It's also much, much broader, wider than the predatory stink bug, and it has these black and white markings around the outside edge of its body. The predatory soldier bug here has two very pointy spines up near its head. It's much more slender, narrow, uh, lengthwise. It has bright orange legs. And the biggest um, determining factor here is this little black line on the end of its wings. If you see that black line on the back of those stink bugs, brown stink bugs in your garden, know that those are a good stink bug and you should keep them around. Then last, always as a last resort, we can rely on chemical controls. And to control this caterpillar complex, we have quite a few different biological pesticides available. So that is a pesticide derived from a living organism. Um, in this case, we have a soil bacteria um, or two soil bacteria that we have formulated into a spray that we can apply to insects. So the first one we have here is a spinosad product. There are a lot of different types of spinosad products. This is a soil derived bacteria. Um, the way that it works to kill the insect is if the insect consumes it. So if the spinosad is on the plant material and then the insect eats that plant material, or if the insect is contacted when you spray this in the garden, if it actually lands on the insect's body, it can make its way into the insect and it disrupts um, feeding and um, can lead to death. The second biological pesticide that I have chosen to highlight is Bacillus thuringiensis, so Bt. In particular, this is the variety Kerstaki. Um, it's available in one of many formulations. This one is called Dipel. This again is a soil derived bacteria that you spray onto the plant tissue. And in this situation, the insect has to consume it. So just contacting the body of the insect is not going to do enough. The, the chemical the, has to make its way into the insect's gut and within the stomach, it interacts with the pH of the gut and it then cuts open or breaks open the stomach and kills the insect. So for both of these, some level of feeding is going to happen after you apply the product. And so putting it on early when the caterpillars are younger is going to help increase its efficacy. The smaller they are, the less they need to eat to consume a lethal dose. Okay, the next group of pests we're gonna move on to are aphids. Why are they so annoying? Well, they're very small and sneaky. They're excellent vectors of plant pathogens. I often think of them as like a flying syringe, a needle going from plant to plant moving diseases. And they feed directly on the phloem of the plant, which is all of the sugars. And it's so much sugar that they can't digest it all. So they excrete part of it out of the back of their body in the form of honeydew, which is another um, sort of pest that results as part of their infestation on the plant. This honeydew can attract other insects to the plant and protect the aphids from natural enemies, and it can also create the secondary pest growth of sooty mold, which blocks the ability of the plant to photosynthesize. There are hundreds of different species. Oftentimes, it doesn't really matter. But just to give you an idea, one of them is the green peach aphid, which feeds on over 100 different plants. The other is the potato or tomato aphid, which you can see in green or pink form, forms, which feeds on around 30 different plants. So sometimes the identity of the aphid can help in terms of what plants it's feeding on, but oftentimes they feed on a lot of different ones. So just knowing what plant it came from is not enough. When we actually get down into the taxonomy and trying to identify them, it's very small characteristics related to the shape of their head or the shape of their butt or characteristics on their feet. So for all intents and purposes, an aphid is an aphid when it comes to growing fruits and vegetables. 
Aphids go through what we call incomplete metamorphosis. So what this means is the juveniles look a lot like the adults, and they oftentimes occur on the exact same part of the plant. Again, they feed with these piercing sucking mouth parts. They can kill seedlings or young transplants outright, but they can also just be a, a contaminant, a physical contaminant on the crop, especially when you're growing leafy greens. You will not encounter eggs when you're finding aphids. What you will see are mature adults and nymphs. They give live birth to more offspring. So you often see this telescoping of generations where you'll see uh, a reproductive female and then young behind her that progressively get larger, the smallest being the most recently born at the front and larger at the back. Sometimes they have wings and sometimes they do not. So don't let that surprise you. So here's an example of when they're actually a physical contaminant. So here on a head of lettuce, all of these little white flaky bits are the skin that they shed as they grow. And then there are the aphids themselves also present on here. So chemically, there's nothing wrong with this head of lettuce. And you could just be very um, vigorous and washing this insect off and then it's fine to eat. But most people are not gonna wanna just take a leaf off of here um, with this much insect debris. The secondary um, problem that occurs from aphid infestations is the sooty mold. So here we don't really care that aphids are on the leaves of cucumbers because we're eating the fruits. But what happens when you get high populations is that honeydew they excrete rains down and then mold grows and then these leaves will die because they can't get to the sunlight and photosynthesize. Um, so for aphids, we really have three of those groups of tools that are effective at managing them. Cultural, biological, and chemical. Mechanical tools are not um, very effective and actually can things like exclusion can make aphids worse. So one of the cultural controls is monitoring and early detection. Like I mentioned, aphids can feed on a lot of different plants. And so looking at what the weeds are around your cropping system and the potential reservoirs for these aphids, here we have aphids on henbit, aphids on some broadleaf weeds and grasses. Um, if these weeds go unmanaged or you plant your crops right next to them, oftentimes those aphids can move right over. So knowing if you have them present and then watching your crop closely to see if they move on to it and become an issue. And if so, the next thing you want to do is look for natural enemies. So this is biological control. There are a variety of parasitic wasps that attack aphids. Here are two pictured. And what they do, again, is they um, stab them into the body and lay an egg inside the aphid. And the egg hatches and feeds on the aphid from the inside out, creating these mummies. And then when the wasp exits, they chew a hole. So if you have uh, parasitic wasps in your crop, you'll see these sort of bronze colored mummies present, which is a good sign because that means that those aphids are dead and there are more um, wasps coming out to help suppress the population. We also have lace wings. These are commercially available to purchase or naturally available in the environment. In this case, the larvae are predators, which you see here on the right. Sometimes they're also called ant lions, which is another insect, not to be confusing, but um, the adults feed on pollen and nectar. So you don't get pest suppression from the adults, but the adults are flying around um, visiting flowers and laying eggs. And then when those eggs hatch, you have voracious predators in your crop. Another one are lady beetles. So in this situation, both larvae and adults are predators. They are beetles. They go through complete metamorphosis. So you will find eggs on the crop. You will find larvae pictured here, and they progressively get larger and larger and then go through a resting pupil stage, which oftentimes is just hanging right on the plant or a structure near the plant, and then out emerges an adult. So all of these life stages, well, the eggs aren't eating and the pupae aren't eating, but as the larvae hatch and molt, and then the adults are both suppressing the pest. Another one that we have is the minute pirate bug. Again, this one's commercially available to purchase or occurs naturally. Nymphs and adults are predators, and these are true bugs. So again, they have a piercing sucking mouth part that they use to stab into aphids. 
They love to feed on flowers and pollen. So having flowers near your vegetable crop can help with their establishment. And oftentimes in August, when there are a lot of them, they will bite like crazy and get on your um, arms. And so you'll notice that sometimes. Uh, last here is one of my favorites. So this is surfid flies. So the larvae are predators, but you are probably most familiar with the adults here. They fly around and sort of lap up the sweat on your body. Um, but the larvae are little maggots because they're flies, we call them maggots, that occur on the leaves on the underside. They look like little slugs and they will scrunch along the leaf and feed on aphids. And you can see them here stabbing their mouth into this aphid and consuming this aphid. There are a lot of different species that are naturally occurring, but you have to look close to see if they're present because they're so small and discreet, they oftentimes blend in with the plant. And if you don't have enough natural enemies or they're not doing the job in terms of suppressing the population, then we can turn to chemical controls. And so one of the things to keep in mind with aphids is that if you have a low population and there's no disease present that they're transmitting, that's probably okay. And so what you have to do is just monitor that population, flag it and come back and watch. And if they're remaining on the leaf in fairly low numbers, then you probably don't have to intervene. You likely have biologicals um, present, natural enemies that are contributing. But if that population continues to grow, if you come back day after day and there's more and more and they're spreading, then your natural enemies are probably not doing the job. There is a large suite of potential chemicals that are available to help manage aphids. It really depends on the goal of the level of suppression that you're looking for and the crop that you're growing. Some of these are more toxic in that they linger around in the environment longer and can impact a lot of different insects. And some of them are a little more benign where you spray it, spray it on the plant and within a, a few hours or days that chemical is washed away and is not so effective anymore. And so you want to make sure that you just look at the label and think about what level of control you need. I think for a home garden or a small farm, sometimes insecticidal soap and horticultural oils, which are some of these two here, are enough to manage these. And the way that those products work is that you have to physically cover the body of the aphid and it breaks down the cuticle or it suffocates that insect. And so they come in a spray bottle ready to apply and you just wanna spray over where those high infestations are. You want to be careful. Some plants are a bit sensitive to these, especially if you have high heat, they can burn the plant tissues. And the last pest that we're going to talk about today are cucumber beetles. Um, they are a pest. There's a wide variety of different species of cucumber beetles. Here I'm showing you the striped cucumber beetle and the spotted cucumber beetle. Two main differences here is that the striped beetle feeds only on cucurbits. So if you have no cucurbit crops present, then you will not experience it. The spotted cucumber beetle, however, can move from different crops um, and is not um, a specialist on cucurbits. So they may go on to tomatoes or sweet corn and then come over to your cucurbit curbits and usually occur later in this in the um, season. Both of them, um, the adults are above ground and you'll see them on the plant. They feed on the leaves, they feed on the fruits, they feed on the stems, so they can be quite devastating. But in addition to their direct damage is the bacterial pathogen that they transmit when they feed on the plant. And so this bacterial pathogen is called Erwinia tracheophila. It leads to bacterial wilt. So it's a bacteria that lives in the xylem of the plant or the water transport structures of the plant. And when the bacteria gets in that xylem after a beetle cuts a hole and then poops on the plant, the bacteria moves from the poop into the, the xylem or the water transport 
And in that structure in the plant, the bacteria begins to replicate and it clogs it up. It's really thick and gooey and gummy. And so then water can't move from one point of the plant to the other. And that's where that wilt comes from that you see. Um, there are some differences among our cucurbit crops in terms of their um, susceptibility to wilt. So cantaloupe and cucumbers, very susceptible. So they will get the bacterial disease in addition to the direct feeding damage from the beetles. Pumpkins and watermelons and squash are more resistant or not tolerant at all. And so you oftentimes will only experience the direct feeding from the beetles on these crops, but will, you will not see the wilting and vine decline as a result of the Erwinia infection. Cucumber beetles overwinter as adults and the bacteria resides in their gut. So they are overwintering in our climates with that bacteria in their gut. We experience when talking about the striped cucumber beetle, two pulses or peaks of this organism um, in the environment in which it causes damage. First, you have that overwintering adult in the spring. It's going to move out of weedy habitats and it's going to scour the landscape looking for cucurbits. That adult is feeding then directly on the leaves as it's looking for partners to mate and lay eggs. They lay their eggs on the stem of the plant or at the base of the plant. The eggs hatch and the larvae of this beetle feed underground in the root zone. Um, oftentimes, if the plants are large enough, you don't really see damage and they can recover from that little bit of larval feeding. So you have this initial pulse of the adults chewing on these young um, seedlings. They can kill the plant. If the plant survives that, the larvae don't do too much damage underground, but then they um, will finish their life cycle, pupate, and that second emergence or second peak of beetles is when the adults then of this new generation come out of the ground and begin feeding on the plants again. And that is the same adult that will overwinter until next year. It's important when you think about managing them to understand that a major portion of their life cycle is happening here below ground in the soil on these plants. So we're going to review four different types of control methods for cucumber beetles. We have cultural, mechanical, biological, and chemical. So thinking about the biology and the way that these overwinter, one of our main cultural strategies is delayed planting. If you can wait to plant your cucurbits until after that peak emergence of those adults coming out of their overwintering habitat and looking for food, then you can miss that first point of pressure. And it's really detrimental about this timing because little young seedlings don't have a lot of plant material to give away to the beetles feeding. So what you end up with is this complete desiccation or decimation of seedlings. If they're put out too early and left unprotected, the beetles can eat them. If you do wanna get your crop out early, but you still need to protect it from these beetles, one thing that you can use is that exclusion again, which we mentioned for the um, crucifer caterpillar complex. In high tunnels, we have been able to identify a screen size that is large enough to allow some of our smaller beneficial insects and in the air to move to ventilate the crop, but keep out the cucumber beetles. So this size is very different depending on what you're trying to exclude. But so in high tunnels, you can install permanent screens. In the fields, you can put these low tunnels on. Now cucurbits are a pollinator dependent crop meaning that once this crop starts to bloom and you have flowers present, you need to either remove the tunnels completely or open them up so uh, pollinators have access to the crop. So you can install them early to protect against that first pulse of adults and those young seedlings that don't have a lot of foliage um, to share with herbivores. 
When it comes to natural enemies, we don't have a lot available, but it is worth noting that there are some generalists in the environment that will feed on these. And one of those in particular are spiders. Spiders are really good. Um, this in particular is a salticid or a hunting spider, jumping spider. So they will sort of sit and stalk those beetles and jump out at them and grab them and eat them. Um, but oftentimes when it comes to this pest, if you do experience them and can't avoid them with um, delayed planting or mechanical exclusion, we have to turn to bio, uh, to chemicals. And here I've highlighted two. So this is a tough insect um, because really what you have access to is the adult. That's the one doing the feeding on the foliage above ground. And adult insects are very well protected. And so um, the chemistries that are available for homeowners or small farmers um, are very limited in terms of what is actually effective. So I'm highlighting two here that we know has um, some efficacy against cucumber beetles. The first is an organic, and again, this is that spinosad, which we talked about earlier. So this acts as a stomach and a contact poison. So if you can spray it on the plant and get it on the outside of the adults, it can help knock that population back. Um, an alternative that a lot of people use is seven dust. So this is a dust that you sprinkle on the plant. Um, the insects will come in contact with it when they uh, crawl over the plant material or when they eat it. Again, this one has a mode of action through the stomach and um, contact poison, so it can be consumed or just touch their body. Both of these are what I would consider broad spectrum, meaning that they do kill a lot of different insects. Carbaryl is the active ingredient in seven, although that has changed lately. So you need to make sure if you buy these products, you look right here on the label, it will tell you exactly what that active ingredient is because the name is misleading. But carbaryl can be detrimental to pollinators and a lot of beneficial insects. So, and spinosad can also be detrimental to both of those. So regardless of the fact that this one is an organic, um, they both have what we call non-target effects. So making sure that you use them only when necessary and um, targeting really when you have the peak level of that pest present so that you can do one application and minimize excess in the environment is best. Um, just again, a little bit more general uh, notes about pesticide use in your garden. So when you go to the garden store, you will see a lot of options on the shelf. I really, really encourage you to look at what those active ingredients are in those and, and read the label to make sure you know what you're putting on. And so I pulled a few notes from the labels of these four um, common products that you can find at any box store or garden store. And so the products were seven, ortho insect, mite and disease control, Dr. Earth vegetable, organic insect killer, which is OMRI approved or organic approved, and insecticidal super soap. The active ingredients are listed um, on those labels. So this version of seven is zeta cypermethrin. Um, this one is sulfur, natural oils and extracts, and potassium salts of fatty acids. One thing that every label will tell you is, is it safe for pets? This is important to know. If you have a lot of pets in your, in your, um, in your garden and you want to apply this, you may have to make sure that you keep your dog and cat out of that. So the only one that's a safe for pets is this Dr. Earth. And then you want to look at what is the compound targeting? If it's something like seven, which targets everything, then you have to think about what that means for pollinators and beneficial insects that may also be present on your crop. Some of them have a little bit more specific efficacy, so a smaller range of organisms. And so that may be a way to help increase or retain the natural enemies. But in general, know that the label is the law. So whatever the label tells you, you have to abide by in terms of how much to put on the plant, how long you have to wait before you can eat that crop. 
And it also means that things like Dawn dish soap or Tabasco hot sauce are not labeled as chemicals on plants. That means they haven't been evaluated for their efficacy and their safety. And so you should not be putting those in your home garden. Um, another important thing to note is do not use landscape products on edible crops. There is a reason for that. Um, the concentrations on products that are labeled for edible crops like fruits and vegetables have been tested to be sure that they are safe to consume after it's being put on. And in some situations, you may have the same active ingredient, but in a landscape product formulation, that level of chemical can be much higher um, because you're not consuming that. So make sure you're only using ones labeled for your fruits and vegetables. Um, and then lastly, here are a few resources of some websites that we maintain um, where you can find more information about diagnoses and um, advice on management. And if you can't figure out what the problem is, the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab can help you um, and will provide some recommendations. And lastly, I leave you with my contact information and another cup of coffee, my cat. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, and I don't know if you want to chime in in the chat or ask any questions. Laura, thank you so much. That was an incredible uh, presentation. Um, I learned so much because I have a garden and I love to garden. And yeah, now I have lots of things to do. So I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Please. Okay, I guess if no one else says, I have a question. Um, so what um, resources are out there to determine um, maybe beneficial uh, insects versus the harmful ones? For example, you were showing us um, the, the soldier bugs or stink bugs. Yes, yes, exactly. Is there a resource that we can look at that shows those differences? Yeah, so unfortunately, Purdue doesn't have one yet. Um, I'm working on making it. But if you look online, um, I believe Virginia Tech Extension in particular has a really good guide to stink bugs. And in that guide, they will describe um, the beneficial insects versus the pest insects within that group. Um, the other really great resource that I highly recommend is Farming with Native Beneficial Insects, I believe it's called, from the Xerces Society. This is a really great book that will go through uh, a lot of the common beneficial insects that you may encounter and shows you good pictures and also talks about some um, strategies around habitat manipulation and to help you promote those beneficial insects. I see the um, question in the chat. So Lori asks, are there natural predators for chiggers in the garden? Oh, chiggers are tough. Um, I see I'm looking at them quickly. There are there are predatory mites that will feed on chiggers, um, but nothing that you could like commercially buy and add to the garden to help suppress them. I would guide you to the, um, let me put the website here, the Consumer Horticulture website, because I know there are articles on that website about chiggers for homeowners. So I just put that back in the chat, um, HLA Yard and Garden website. You can find some information there. Similar to Joelle's question, is there a chart or map to know which pests come up at which times, temps, and rainfall? Good question, Julie. Um, we don't have a central sort of interface database that can help you with predicting that. Um, what we do have, if you just look at some of the extension vegetable publications about insects in your home and garden, um, 
it tells you a little bit about the biology and the time of year in which you can anticipate encountering some of those pests. But the other thing is, um, I'm going to put something in the text in the chat box for you of a degree day calendar that Madison publishes. And they have a lot of different organisms that you can pick from and um, you can look at sort of what the weather has been like in Madison at least and how um, what you can expect in your area. Again, Indiana doesn't have that, but I will put it um, in the chat for you. That's as close as we can get. All right, when, Laura, when you get another chance, <laughs> there's a question from Cheryl asking, is it beneficial to plant flowers in, is it beneficial to plant flowers <laughs> in with vegetable garden? Yes, it is. So a lot of those, um, a lot of those natural enemies that we talked about today for all of the pests, benefit from habitat diversification. And so having high and low and ground cover, spiders are gonna be moving up and down in the plant, ground cover protects ground beetles. And so flowers will provide that habitat that's not being interrupted and pruned and, and harvested constantly. But also there's that floral resource of pollen and nectar. And many, many of the beneficial insects are what we call omnivores which means they feed on other insects in addition to plant material, so pollen and nectar. And so in a situation where you may not have a high enough pest population to support that natural enemy, they can forage on those flowers instead and move back and forth into the crop when the pests are present. So flowers are always a good thing. Having that resource staggered, so some type of flower present always, and flowers that have pollen and nectar that are accessible to insects. Okay, there is another question from Lori. What is your opinion about using diatomaceous earth in the garden? So diatomaceous earth works in the way, um, it's an abrasive essentially. And the way that it acts as an insecticide is that the insect itself has to encounter the diatomaceous earth and sort of move its body over that substance and what it does is cuts a whole bunch of little holes in the outside of that insect and so the insects have their bones on the outside of their body their cuticle if you cut through those bones and those holes then you open wounds for other diseases or you interfere with moisture retention or respiration and breathing and so in some situations, diatomaceous earth can be very effective because the insect can be forced to move across a path that is covered in that and it can kill that insect. In the garden, most of the research that um, I have read about using diatomaceous earth is not very good. It's not very effective. Um, in most situations, because it doesn't linger a long time on the plant, and so rain and water can dislodge it, and the insect is more of a, in an open environment, and so it has the ability to move around that sort of physical deterrent. Um, there is a guide, um, Organic Insect and Disease Management, that has a table that will show you some of the examples of where diatomaceous earth actually is effective. And I will put that in the chat as well um, because it's free PDF from Cornell. And the, what I just put in is one of those thermal degree day models if you wanna look at sort of what the risk is for some pests in your environment. Um, and then here is the link to the guide that will actually show you 
some situations in which diatomaceous earth is effective and can be useful for pest management, but it also, it has almost all the active ingredients for organics. And so it can help you make decisions about which ones are the best to choose. Awesome. Does anybody else have any questions before um, we close out for the day? Laura, you did such an amazing job. There are several um, compliments in the chat about learning a lot and feeling more relaxed with their pest control. Thank you. If you have any questions, anyone uh, follow up, you know, feel free to email me directly. Um, sometimes I come out and visit farms and gardens as well. That's the fun part of my job. So please just let me know. Okay, perfect. All right, real quick. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so thank you all for joining us for coffee and pest management. Um, next month, let's see if I can, oh, that's not going to work out. Um, well, next month we're having coffee and um, fall cover crops. So that we're going to have Ellie Blaine with us and she is, um, she is with the Indiana uh, State Association of Soil and Water Districts um, and she is really um, good at what she does. So that will be on Wednesday, August 17th um, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. And along with um, the recording of this webinar, I will be sending a link to the next one for coffee and fall cover crops. And basically Ellie will be talking about um, how to how to plant cover crops first off and then which ones um, you should choose for your garden um, based off what those cover crops can do. Um, additionally, we also have a day at the lake coming up on August 16th, um, which will be the day before uh, coffee and fall cover crops. Um, so this is an awesome opportunity that we take every year. It's an all day trip, um, which we go up to Putten Bay, Ohio, uh, which is in Lake Erie. Um, we tour the Ohio State University's Aquatic Visitor Center. Um, we get to go on their research vessels and see how they um, troll for fish, which is really, really cool. Um, there is even lunch. The cost of that is $50 per person, which is pretty good for an all day trip. And that's basically covering your food, um, and a little bit of gas. Uh, so it's a really good deal for the trip and you get to learn a lot, um, as well as going to South Bass Island, um, and Putin Bay. And then finally upcoming is our, um, at the end of July, July 29th is the Allen County Fairs Ag Day. Um, and that's going to be, we have several um, sessions that day. One of them is 10 a.m. Um, Dave Vores, who is with First Source Bank, is going to be talking about how to start your small business. And that's from a banker's perspective. So if you're interested in starting a small business, whether it's for your garden or your farm, um, or you just want to learn a little bit more if you're a commercial gardener, um, this is a great place to start. Um, then that will be 10 a.m. on July 29th. And then right after that at 11 a.m., um, Mike Whirling will be talking about cover crops and their impact on soil health. Um, and Mike Whirling is also great, always great to listen to. So um, that those are our upcoming events. Um, Laura, I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. You did amazing. I learned a lot. I know everyone else did too. Everyone, you'll be getting your recording of this webinar um, in the next couple of days. So thank you so much, Laura, and thanks for everyone who joined us. Thank you.